Late summer 1939. Once again, harvest time in Europe was a time of danger. On September the 1st, the long-awaited, long-dreaded event occurred. Nazi Germany attacked Poland with all the fearful panoply of the Blitzkrieg. Against all likelihood, France and Britain declared war on Germany. The Second World War had begun. This was a sour fruit of the Great War, a war to end wars leading straight to war. For well, there was a clear line, if one cared to see it, running through all the twists of Adolf Hitler's broken promises, torn up treaties, falsehoods, and fulminations. First, Hitler had defiantly repudiated the treaty imposed on Germany in 1919. Secondly, he proclaimed and pursued the unity of the German race, an ancient dream. Thirdly, he sought space in which the United Germans might expand and thereby dominate. For Hitler, like the Teutonic Knights of the Middle Ages, the natural area of German expansion was the East, the wide, empty, fertile plains of Russia. Step by step, by fraud and violence, he prepared the way for his march to the East. Just as his opposition to communism in Germany had made him endurable to the middle classes, the capitalists and the army, so his declared enmity towards communist Russia had made him endurable to the West. The West had accepted the reoccupation of the Rhineland, the Austrian Anschluss, the regaining of the Sudetenland, and even the seizure of Czechoslovakia. Surely the West would also accept the attack on Poland. We regard the agreement signed last night... But in August 1939, the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact was signed. This pact with Stalin seemed to free Hitler's hands for any mischief, and that was more than the Western powers could bear. So war came. To Hitler's astonishment, to the astonishment of France and Britain themselves, and what followed was not least astonishing. Poland collapsed in three weeks, and there did not seem to be anything the West could do about it. So, the West did nothing, and Hitler did nothing against the West. Along the great Maginot Line, the flames of war which had consumed the Poles flickered only feebly. Here, the war was skirmishes and petty raids and nothing else. The forts remained silent, the mighty batteries made no sound. Yet there were sounds to be heard at the turn of the year, sounds in plenty. The voices, the music, the slogans, the songs of an uneasy, bewildered season, fast vanishing in the mists of memory. Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. It was a terrible year. It was a wonderful year. It was, to my mind, an unforgettable year. It was 1940. The shepherd will tend his sheep The 
Another age of innocence is coming to an end. The sounds of 25 years ago, 1940. This is London. The Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Neville Chamberlain. Germany used her brute force upon unhappy Poland. Today we can see how she is treating the Poles and the Czechs, exploiting their resources, carrying off their food, starving and shooting the people, tearing them and uprooting them from their homes. And no doubt, they would rejoice if they could treat us as they're treating the victims who are already within their grip. But we, at the beginning of this new year, can await the future with unshaken confidence in the strength of our arms and in the righteousness of our cause. It was a hard winter, the hardest winter for over 40 years. In Britain, the snow, as usual, took us by surprise, as if we'd never seen any before. Then we'd never seen a war like this before either. Anything might happen, but meanwhile, nothing was happening except the foul weather. Here on the Western Front, or elsewhere, all Europe, except Hitler and the German general staff, joined in a common freeze-up, a common bewilderment, a common vague feeling that we might all be moving into an unknown that might provide the strangest surprises. It was a hard, hard winter, and to some of us, a queer and sinister time. Our small expeditionary force in France was training hard, but for what? A continuation of the 1914-1918 war? But of course, we had an old and well-tried alliance with the greatest military power in Western Europe, France. And France now had 2,800,000 men under arms, over a million more than the Germans. But though the French outnumbered the Germans, they'd never moved. They were the prisoners of a strictly defensive idea. Perhaps because France lived in dread of suffering once again the appalling casualties of the Great War. Although there had been no war on land, the war at sea had been on from the beginning. And a new and very important element had come into it, the air. German aircraft were already being used to stop, board and requisition neutral ships. Churchill, as first Lord of the Admiralty, kept warning neutral countries and urging them to unite with us against Nazism. Among the sounds of time, another voice on the air, William Joyce, known here as Lord Orhor. How on earth can Britain expect to be taken seriously? when she pretends to respect the rights of other countries. The British Empire holds a good many subjugated people under its sway. And now she is looking for other regime and governments, naive enough to allow themselves to be sacrificed in the interests of the British and French plutocracies. The battle of words was on, but the most important neutral wasn't listening yet. It was an election year, and no American president could commit his nation, still largely isolationist in feeling, to play any part in a European war. The first president of the United States warned us against entangling foreign alliances. The present president of the United States subscribes to and follows that precept. Then the thaw came, and with it the floods, which of course again took us by surprise. But the war brought no surprises yet. It remained, as the Americans first called it, the phony war.
We were supposed to be arming ourselves as fast as we could, yet we still had a million unemployed. We were losing ships, yet the shipbuilders, highly skilled men, who'd left the closed shipyards and moved south to become garage hands, caretakers, anything, weren't tracked down and put to their proper work again. Krupp's vast munition works couldn't be bombed, we were told, because they were private property. We risked airmen and valuable aircraft dropping leaflets, not bombs. We were indulging in what is probably our greatest national vice, self-deception. Thousands more of the British Army have arrived in France to swell the numbers of the original British Expeditionary Force. France is said to have more than six million men under arms, but Britain amply demonstrates her willingness to share the burden of the war on the Western Front. Yes, they all look healthy and happy. Another nasty headache for Hitler. So wish them luck and a safe return when the job's well done. So I replied that if I must say something, it would be that if the Germans had not won the war by next June, they would have lost it by the November after. Easter in 1940 was very much an Easter as usual. There was the usual rush to the seaside, whether or no weather. There was the usual fun at the fair. The last some of these people would see for a long time. And the last some of them would see forever. Over in France, our troops were now maneuvering with tanks. Better late than never, but very, very late. And enjoying popular topical songs. Now imagine me in the marginal line, sitting on a mine in the marginal line. Now it's turned out nice again, the army life is fine. Hitler can't kid us a lot, his secret weapons tell me rot. You ought to see what the sergeant's got down on the marginal line. I heard Formby sing that song at the Palladium and it made my blood run cold. The marginal line wasn't funny. Now, there is no doubt, Alan Brook wrote, that the whole conception of the Maginot line is a stroke of genius, and yet it gives me but little feeling of security. Its most dangerous aspect is a psychological one, a sense of false securities engendered, a feeling of sitting behind an impregnable iron fence, and should the fence be broken, the French fighting spirit might well be crumbling with it. And there was something disquieting, sinister, about this waiting for something to happen. A great army immovably on the defensive, like a tied up goat waiting for a tiger to spring. So a famous old city like Strasbourg, because it was in front of the Maginot Line, could be evacuated, could wait there, empty and still, a city like a condemned prisoner in a death cell. All's quiet up on the Western Front, but more than a million German soldiers are drawn up, ready to attack at a few hours' notice, all along the frontiers of Luxembourg, of Belgium and of Holland. At any moment, these neutral countries may be subjected to an avalanche of steel and fire, and the decision rests in the hands of a haunted, morbid being who, to their eternal shame, the German peoples, in their bewilderment, have worshipped as a god. Germany was now getting ready to move. Even on their National Memorial Day, 
when Germany commemorates the dead of the Great War, Hitler spoke not in terms of sorrow but of vengeance and urged his followers to advance over the graves of their dead forward. He and his generals were planning a huge revenge. And they weren't looking back to the first war, but thinking in terms of a different kind of warfare, audacious and fast moving, shattering lines of defense by the sheer weight and speed of mass tanks and motorized divisions. Now the German army was training hard to put these ideas into practice, preparing a terrible blow. German industry was now working day and night. Big guns, big shells, the barbed wire that a civilization going rotten can't do without. And behind the armaments, all the airsat stuff the Germans would have to make do with until they could loot all Western Europe. Soon the dive bombers, the Stukas, would come screaming down as they were already doing at sea. The sea was hard and dangerous, and on the whole, we were fighting it successfully. We brought back the convoy system from the Great War. Here we are, first night out, and look like running into thick fog. Nobody liked fog. You know what a fog is like in the blackout on shore. Think about a blackout at sea. And we were using our own aircraft in coastal command as an umbrella. I was standing on deck talking to an officer when he suddenly pointed to the skies and said, Hello, there's Monty. Sure enough, there was a speck in the sky. And as it came closer, we made out the shape of a well-known British reconnaissance plane. Just coming to see that we were all right, but to give a hand in spotting any U-boats that might be lurking by. And we were teaching our merchant seamen to defend themselves. Extra stations. <laughs> Submarine in sight, clear away the gun fraction. Submarine in sight, clear away the gun fraction. Action! Submarine on full beam, load! Ready! Shoot, fire! During the Foley War, it was the Navy that gave us the headline, as when the Graf Spey was driven to destruction months earlier. When the men returned home, we made the most of a moment of glory. The Graf Space supply ship, the Altmark, had taken on board hundreds of British seamen as prisoners. When the Altmark arrived in a Norwegian fjord, the English prisoners were hidden below. Churchill ordered the Altmark to be boarded and the prisoners brought home. It made another big headline. Well, the first intimation we had of the Navy approaching us, and a sudden shiver through the whole of the ship, 
and then voices on top of the iron hatch, and the cleat's been thrown off. And as it slid away, one of us shouted up, who's there? And they said, the Navy, and we replied, what Navy? And they said, the British Navy, and we gave three cheers and boiled out over the top, just like a volcano erupting almost. But we had too much blind faith in the Navy, and so too much faith in the power of our blockade. The new Ministry of Information put out all manner of fatuous stuff. They told the world the Germans were short of everything, from heavy oil to cream buns. But the Germans were confiscating goods taken from neutral ships. And German research chemists, always ingenious, were experimenting with artificial substitutes for anything they were short of, wool and thread and so forth. And the German people were queuing up to give their government any metal household objects that could be melted down for use in the war. And above all, Germany could, of course, buy from the neutrals. It didn't matter to Hitler if he alone had cream buns. What certainly did matter was the iron ore that he could import from Sweden. And in winter, when the Baltic was frozen, this ore went by rail to the Norwegian port of Narvik. So Hitler had to have Narvik. And the British were already laying mines off the Norwegian coast. So Hitler decided he must take Norway and with it Denmark. An invasion was quickly planned and, let's admit it, most brilliantly and audaciously executed. The blow fell on me personally at 5.50 in the morning when I was still in bed in my Copenhagen flat. We were wakened by a mighty roar of engines, wave after wave of bombers, almost at rooftop height. Handfuls of pale green leaflets burst from each plane and floated lazily down to the almost deserted streets. They informed the Danish people that Germany had forestalled an attack on Denmark and Norway by Churchill. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is a special news bulletin. As listeners to our early morning bulletins will have heard, Denmark has been invaded by German forces and Norway is at war with Germany. The German wireless this morning, says Reuter, issued an announcement which confirms that German troops have invaded Denmark and Norway. Here is the text. The High Command of the German Army announces that in order to counteract the actions against Denmark and Norway, the German Army has taken these countries under its protection. Denmark was swallowed like a piece of its own pastry. The German statement that their action is in reply to steps taken by the British and French governments will deceive nobody. So elaborate an operation must have been planned long in advance. For their part, His Majesty's government and the French government have at once assured the Norwegian government that in view of the German invasion of their country, they have decided forthwith to extend their full aid to Norway. Denmark and the Norwegian coast 
have proceeded according to plan today. No significant resistance was offered along the coast of Norway, except near Oslo. Resistance there was broken during the afternoon, and Oslo itself was occupied. Now there were those scenes of confusion and panic that many nations were soon to know. Oslo was captured chiefly by impudence and a German military ban. While the Germans poured into Norway, here in Britain, we began talking solemn nonsense. It must be apparent to the merest tyro in strategy that Hitler, by invading Denmark and part of Norway, has committed a blunder of the first magnitude. Every supporter of the Allied cause will devoutly hope that Hitler continues to be his own strategist in his self-appointed role of commander-in-chief of the, all the German armed forces, he is, as our American friends would say, monkeying with the buzzsaw. British and French war leaders might hurriedly meet, and the French who now had the energetic Paul Reno at the head of them might urge more action in Norway, but Northern Europe was already being chewed up. We did our best sometimes a very brave best, as when the Navy clawed at Narvik. Four German destroyers were shattered and sunk in Narvik Bay. Three others fled up the Rumbus Fjord. These were also pursued, engaged and destroyed. sent in troops at last, but too late. The Germans had the airfields, they had the dive bombers sinking our supply ships, bombing the men wherever they were. There had been something weak, indecisive, bumbling about the handling of the whole Norwegian campaign. We'd been outwitted, outfought, and as a nation humiliated. This fiasco in Norway brought simmering public discontent up to the boil. People felt and said they were not being properly led. We had a government that didn't know how to fight this war. Demands for a new national government were being made not only outside, but also inside Parliament. There, a sensational attack was delivered by Admiral Sir Roger Keyes. There he was, resplendent in his admiral's uniform, his breast covered with medals, and he castigated the government because of their failure at Trondheim, when they ought to have attacked and failed to do so. And then with the speech by Amory, uh, a man of great integrity, a man with great influence in the Conservative Party. And he told Chamberlain in the most blunt fashion to go, made no bones about it. Uh, that, of course, made a considerable impact in the House, and the excitement rose. It became intense, uh, and members who spoke spoke with passion. There were interjections and interruptions. And then we had a speech by Churchill, defending the government, the wind-up speech. Instead of a massive oration, Instead of an adequate defense, he was petulant, he complained about abuse and all the rest of it. And then the vote was taken. Chamberlain's majority went down from 200 to 81. There would have to be a new national government. But when they were asked to join it, the Labour leaders refused to serve under Chamberlain. So, 
on the evening of the 10th of May, Winston Churchill agreed to form and to lead a national government. Two or three days after he became prime minister, there was a knot of people waiting outside. And as we approached them, they said, good old Winnie, God bless you, good luck, sir. And he was visibly moved. And as he opened the door and we got inside, he dissolved into tears. And he said, poor people, poor people, they trust me. And I can give them nothing but disaster for quite a long time. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. The phony war was over. We had stopped for once deceiving ourselves. And not before time. Because now Hitler had invaded Holland, Belgium and France. On May the 10th, Hitler's armies were on the move. service. Here is a short news bulletin. The German army invaded Holland and Belgium early this morning by land and by landings from parachutes. An appeal for help has been made to the Allied governments and Brussels says that Allied troops are moving to their support. There were these two attacks on Holland and Belgium, but the maximum weight of tanks, armored vehicles, motorized troops was to be sent against France crashing through the difficult country of the Ardennes. If it worked and the French and British moved north to assist the Belgians, they would be walking into a trap. We're here standing on the Franco-Belgian frontier. We're watching long columns of British troops and transports and supplies and guns coming through from France into Belgium. The frontier posts are now open. As I'm speaking to you, I can see the columns coming up. Here's another. The welcome given by the Belgian people is really tremendous. Now this looks rather like 1914 all over again. But it was 1940 and a very different war with fast movement on the ground and bombs and men falling from the air. <laughs> While Holland was stunned by these new methods of attack, Chamberlain, now a disillusioned and sick man, made a gallant resignation speech. In my broadcast of September the 3rd last year, I told you that we should be fighting against evil things. My words have proved to be insufficient to describe the vileness of those who have now staked everything the great battle just beginning. And you and I must rally behind our new leader, and with our united strength, and with unshakable courage, fight and work until this wild beast that has sprung out of his lair upon us be finally disarmed and overthrown. Rotterdam was bombed mercilessly. At the end of only five days, 
with that country at the mercy of the German bombers, the Dutch were compelled to surrender. We still believed that the main German attack would swing through Belgium to the coast, the famous old Schlieffen plan. And so the Allies moved forward to take up their defensive positions. Weather, the weather may be wet or fine. We'll just rub along without a care. We're going to hang out washing on the sea-free line. If that sea-free line still the Albert Canal and the great Belgian fortresses were to hold up the German advance, but they didn't. The Germans had been rehearsing new methods of dealing with these fortresses, using troops landed by gliders to blow them up. And then to cross the canal. The British position was now precarious. They had no alternative. They had to retreat. And on roads blocked by thousands of civilian fugitives. As the tide of invasion rolled on, many of these unfortunate people found themselves in a position from which there was no escape. The whole Allied line was now moving back. And though they didn't know it, they were in the trap. Now came the attack through the Ardennes. It began through country which had been lost by Germany to Belgium at the end of the First World War. They were being cheered by people who were technically Belgian subjects. It was a good omen. For this was the great gamble, an attack through difficult wooded country, considered impassable by the French, with the swiftest and most powerful striking force the world had yet seen, armored columns reaching back a hundred miles. The passage of this gigantic force was probably the supreme triumph of German staff work and organization in this war. The German columns were supported by menacing fleets of Stukas, the dive bombers. line was thinly held there, no strong defense was thought necessary, when suddenly the German tanks came roaring out of the woods. German infantry were swarming behind the Panzer striking columns. Even under French artillery barrages, bridges were rapidly constructed so that the tanks could cross. like the Meuse, which had seemed appalling obstacles in the First War, were crossed rapidly, every detail having been carefully planned and rehearsed in advance. Now came the crunch of the great gamble. The tanks were across the Meuse, breaking the weak French line in three places. The bulk of the infantry hadn't yet caught up with them. Hitler had to decide 
whether to play safe and wait for the infantry or gamble everything on the tanks. He finally decided to risk the lot on one grand coup. He gave orders for the tanks to make a great right wheel turning west and to make for the coast as fast as they could go. If they succeeded, they would cut the French armies in two and completely trap the British expeditionary force and many of the best French divisions. And with the crossing of the Meuse, the way was wide open. At half past seven in the morning, I telephoned Churchill. I woke him up. I told him, we have lost the battle. We are beaten. The church it seemed so astonished that I had to repeat, we are beaten, we have lost the battle. Impossible, he said. Experience shows that after a certain time, every offensive fizzles out of its own accord. It's so different now, I said. He said, torrent of panzer streaming in. As the panzer divisions went roaring on and the danger became more apparent, Churchill hurried over to Paris to meet the military leaders of France. General Gamelin, the French commander-in-chief, told an unmitigated tale of woe. Churchill, by way of cheering him up, slapped him on the back. The general winced. And Churchill asked, which way are you going to counterattack, General? From the north or from the south? And Gamelin answered, I've got nothing to counterattack with. The panzers went on and on. And the dive bombing Stukas went screaming ahead of them and loading their bombs on anybody and anything to create havoc and confusion. Without any plan of defense now, the French were retreating everywhere. And well behind the tanks came the mass of German infantry, confident, singing, the scent of victory mingling with the smells of burning buildings, dust and death, now in the air. But Hitler, having committed most of his armor to this great gamble, was worried. Perhaps his tanks were going too quickly. And if he lost them, if the Allies did what of course they ought to have done, if they broke his long, thin line, Germany was finished. The map told him nothing. Was there a French army in reserve, ready to strike? What was happening so far seemed too good to be true. But it wasn't. I speak to you for the first time as Prime Minister in a solemn hour for the life of our country, of our allies, and above all, of the cause of freedom. A tremendous battle is raging in France and Flanders. The Germans, by a remarkable combination of air bombing and heavily armored tanks, have broken through the French defences north of the Maginot Line and strong columns of their armoured vehicles are ravaging the open country which for the first day or two was without defenders. They have penetrated deeply and spread alarm and confusion in their track. Behind them there are now appearing infantry in lorries and behind them again the large masses are moving forward. Arm yourselves and be ye men of valor and be in readiness for the conflict. For it is better for us to perish in battle than to look upon the outrage of our nation and our altars.
after seven days, the Germans rolled into Aberdeen. They had reached the coast. The great gamble, in part a great bluff, had paid off. He had won the jackpot. The British and French forces in Belgium were now in the trap. A German army was pressing from the north and the east, and now to the south, the German tanks and panzer divisions had reached the sea and were moving north to strike the final blow. Hitler, who had served in the first war near the unconquerable Ypres, now paid it a visit and passed at last through the Menin Gate and showed himself for once among his victorious soldiers. You'd hardly believe there was a war on if you'd walked down the Champs-Élysées that afternoon. And it was almost impossible to believe that the fiercest battle in history was raging so comparatively near. And then, after an uneventful day yesterday, came the shattering news this morning of the capitulation by King Leopold of the Belgians. This incredible act of treason, as some of the French papers have described it, has caused a storm of consternation and fury among the French people. These sentiments are legitimate, says the Territoire. This king has permitted our heroic soldiers and their brave British comrades to be hit in the back by the enemy. The one port left, the one door still open, was Dunkirk and a savage rearguard action had to be fought to keep the line of retreat open to Dunkirk. Nothing else could be done. Britain held a national day of prayer. So did France. Now, precious stores had to be destroyed. The German armoured columns were only 12 to 15 miles from Dunkirk and were ready for the kill. But Hitler ordered them not to move. Perhaps he didn't want to risk his precious armour among the canals and flooded fields of the Flanders he remembered. Perhaps he didn't care if some of the British escaped, because he said they would never return. But it's most likely that he allowed himself to be persuaded by Goering, head of his air force and jealous of the army's success, to allow the dive bombers to finish off the British and French packed into Dunkirk. All we know for certain is that the tanks didn't move and the attack by air began. Churchill and the Admiralty made plans for a rescue by sea. They thought that 30 to 40,000 men might be taken off the beaches. I thought at the time that this is going to be a job to shift all this crowd. We we'll never do it, picking them up spoonfuls at a time like this. So for the next nine days, the German dive bombers took over and the men on the beaches, the ships coming and going, and above all, the mole, essential to the rescue operation, were under a terrible rain of bombs. Nine days, there were men waiting in long, patient lines, sometimes up to their necks in water. You got the occasional chap being hit by a shell splinter and just floating away. 
uh, no one did anything about it. I think we were too tired and exhausted by that time. Well, we waited for about five hours, and then a lifeboat came along and stood off about 10 yards from us, and we shouted, and uh, it edged its way in a little bit further, and, and it wouldn't come any further, because I think he th thought there'd be an ugly rush to get on board anyhow. Eventually, we waded out until the water was about up to our chins, and we got to there. And it wasn't just a question of naval vessels taking the men away. The call went out for every sort of vessel, and ferry boats and seaside steamers and fishing boats and private yachts came swarming out, manned by civilian volunteers. And for once, even the weather was on our side. For nine days, the sea was calm, the nights were still. Nine days, the perimeter held. Each day, the Germans crept a little nearer. Each day, the defenders became a little weaker. Each day, men were forced into surrender. But the perimeter held. There was something unexpected, whimsical, very English and almost miraculous about this gigantic improvised rescue operation by sea. It was the largest in all history. They were in the engine room, storerooms, mess decks, galleys, cabins, and piled on the decks, with only a little fighting space left round the guns. Then, thankfully, came the run back, needing very careful use of helm and speed, with the old girl so top-heavy that she felt as if she would roll right over. The stores were gone, equipment had to be left behind, but day by day the figures for the men crept up until in the end, by June 4th, the final day, not 30 to 40,000 men had been taken off the beaches at Dunkirk, but a third of a million. It had been hell, but it ended a marvel. dawn in Dover, nosing alongside the pier, discharging and tallying our catch, rather like a herring drifter. And then away we went for more fuel, ammunition, new orders, and a sleep. And so off for the next night, like a poacher under the moon. There was every kind of ship that I saw coming in this morning, and every one of them was crammed full of tired, battle-stained and blood-stained British soldiers. Soon after dawn this morning, I watched two warships steaming in, one listing heavily to port under the enormous load of men she carried on her decks. The transport officers counted the men as they came ashore. No question of units, no question of regiments, no question even of nationality, for there were French and Belgian soldiers who had fought side by side with the British in the Battle of Flanders. All of them were tired. Some were completely exhausted. But the most amazing thing was that practically every man was reasonably cheerful, and most of them managed to smile. Even when a man was obviously on the verge of collapse from sheer fatigue, you could still tell by his eyes that his spirit was irrepressible. And that is a thing that all the bombs in Germany will never crush. Sir, we must be very careful not to assign to this deliverance the attributes of a victory. Wars are not won by evacuation. Our thankfulness at the escape of our army must not blind us to the fact that what happened in France and Belgium is a colossal military disaster. We are told 
that Herr Hitler had a plan for invading the British Isles. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. In three weeks, Holland, Luxembourg, and Belgium had gone, and all that was left of the British were the burning stores and equipment on the beaches of Dunkirk. And already the vast French army had received a mortal wound. Now the great German machine could wheel, turn, and strike at the very heart of France. young men were told they were about to win a victory that would change the course of history for a thousand years. It was these fanatical young Nazis in the Panzer and Assault Divisions who were the spearhead of Hitler's army. It was an army that believed itself to be invincible and now it had only France to defeat. On June the 5th, the Battle of the Somme began. Not at all like the old Battle of the Somme in 1916, when men died by the thousand over every few yards of ground. Now, after the sudden violence, was movement, was speed, was superb technical know-how, keeping the infantry moving fast. isolated French units often fought with desperate courage, immense thrusts of the German armoured columns slashed through any bewildered attempt to maintain a defence in line. French rarely had the right weapons in the right place. A letter addressed to me was found on the body of a French major who had committed suicide. He had written, I am going to kill myself to let you know, Mr. President, that my men are not cowards, but, but men armed with rifles should not be sent to fight tanks. From the Somme to the Aisne, familiar names from the First War, scenes of long, grim conflicts, merely went flashing past the headlong advance. The fact is that it was like a dam that was suddenly swept away. And the Germans began to appear everywhere in motorized units moving very fast. And the most dreadful stories came through of the troops not fighting. And we then we had the most unbelievable examples of uh, a lack of a will to resist, enormous dumps of petrol everywhere. Nobody set fire to them. Nobody made hinder the German advance. And uh, I myself suggesting to the French that they should send out small units to blow up culverts, to blow up bridges, anything to slow the advance. But nobody was doing that. They were given a complete lift game everywhere.
Before the inexorable German advance, the French roads were choked with refugees. These people are using anything on wheels they can get hold of to move their families and to salvage a few of their more treasured belongings. In five minutes today, I passed a couple of farm carts drawn by tired-looking horses. Then a motor car of unbelievable age and very shaky steering, piled high on top with bedding and a couple of perambulators and a cycle. Just as I was writing that last sentence, a friend of mine came in to say that the Germans have now begun machine gunning these pitiful little parties of refugees, and that in one attack today, four of them, including a woman and her child, were left dead in the ditch in which they were seeking shelter. Mounting civilian casualties and the fear of appalling destruction and bloodshed made the French people and many of their leaders long for an armistice. And now that France was reeling, Italy felt it was time to declare war, or at least to do some cheering. Here was the chief jackal ready to gnaw the French corpse. The Germans were now crossing the Marne, scene of their defeat in 1914, and the last great barrier before Paris. The German infantry were almost exhausted. They'd been ceaselessly on the move for the past month. But now they were almost within sight of Paris, the richest, the most dazzling prize in Europe. came swinging in, thinking of girls and the pounds and pounds of butter they would soon be eating like apples down the boulevard. Paris fell to remain in Nazi hands for the next four years. Paris fell, and its capture was a triumph for the German army and above all, a supreme personal triumph for Hitler himself. And for Britain, a profound shock. The news from France is very bad. We have become the sole champions now in arms to defend the world cause. We shall do our best to be worthy of that high honor. We shall defend our island, and with the British Empire around us, we shall fight on, unconquerable, until the curse of Hitler is lifted from the brows of men. Churchill, as usual, was only expressing what the British people in general felt. And with every new disaster abroad, there was a new spurt of energy at home. We men and women alike are going to work our fingers to the bone for our sons and for their future. We are going to do whatever lies in our power to match and to be worthy of the sacrifices that are being made for us. We are going to cut down our leisure, cut down our comfort, blot out of our thought every private and sectional aim. We must. 
We are going to guard our health and strength, for these are assets in the fight. But we shall be careless of all else, thinking only of arms for the men, arms for victory, arms for liberty. Calling all workers. They worked as most of them had never done before, women as well as men. For now, under Ernest Bevan, who brought nothing less than genius to the Ministry of Labour, industry was mobilised like an army, and not with unwilling and sullen conscripts, but with people anxious and eager to work for a common cause, most of them more alive, more full of energy and zest than they had ever been before, or perhaps since. Since the war began, the government have received countless inquiries from men of all ages who are, for one reason or another, not at present engaged in military service, and who wish to do something for the defense of their country. Well, now is your opportunity. We want large numbers of such men between the ages of 17 and 65. 17 and 65. Come forward now and offer their service in order to make assurance doubly sure. You will not be paid, but you will receive uniform and will be armed. The name of the new force, which is now to be raised, will be the Local Defence Volunteer. Local Defence Volunteer. The day war broke out, my missus looked at me and she said, uh, what good are you? I said, how do you mean, what good am I? And then the missus said, she said, well, what do you do in the home guards? I said, I've got to stop Hitler's army landing. She said, what, you? I said, no, there's Harry Bates and Charlie Evans. I said, there's seven or eight of us all together. I said, we're in a group. It was all very English, half absurd, half glorious. One feature of this dangerous high summer was a sudden desire for the noble consolations of music and the arts. Because people were more alive, whether toiling for their country or guarding it, they demanded, at last, a higher quality of life. Hitler, not a man to spare an opponent when he was down, gave orders that the armistice must be signed at Compiègne, where the Germans admitted their defeat in 1918. 
and in the very same railway coach used then. The French arrived. The French had lost their war. Had it been lost in this year of 1940, or had it been lost years and years before? The fact remains that here was a great military nation compelled to seek the best terms it could obtain. And Hitler had now had enough. He left his generals to dictate some very severe terms. was signed. It was extremely clever, for it left France with a bogus independence based on nothing but the non-industrial south, with Vichy as its capital and the melancholy aged Pétain as its head of government. Je vous dis le 17 juin 1940. The effect of his words were terrible. A Frenchman lunching at the next table broke down and covered his face in his hands. The waitress who was serving us burst into floods of tears and cried, It's shameful. We won't be ruled by the Bosch. I'd rather throw myself into the sea. The burning question now was what was to happen to the fine French battle fleet stationed at Iran. I received the most solemn assurances that no armistice would be signed containing terms which placed the French fleet in danger of being handed over to the enemy for use against the ally of France. The published terms of the armistice, however, made it clear that there was no safeguard against this possibility except the word of the leading aggressor and his henchmen. After lengthy and unsatisfactory negotiations, the British fleet attacked. an ugly episode, shelling our former allies, and I happened to be in the House of Commons when Churchill defended our action with the tears running down his cheeks. The transference of these ships to Hitler would have endangered the security both of Great Britain and the United States. We therefore had no choice but to act as we did. We are, in fact, when hard-pressed, not only a resolute, but perhaps a ruthless nation, as the French discovered and found it hard to forgive us. And the world discovered it too, especially America, where Bullitt, who had been the United States ambassador in Paris, spoke bravely on our behalf. What stands today between the Americas and the unleashed dictatorships? The British fleet and the courage of the British people. It is as clear as anything on this earth that the United States will not go to war. But it is equally clear that war is coming, coming toward the Americas. Do we want to see Hitler in Independence Square, in Independence Hall, Making fun of the Liberty Bell? No! Where are we sleeping, Americans? When are we going to wake up? When are we going to tell our government? The Democratic Party Convention of 1940 was being held. Roosevelt had been angered by the Italian declaration of war and then deeply dismayed by the fall of France. We are convinced that military and naval victory for the gods of force and hate would endanger the institutions of democracy in the Western world, and that equally, therefore, the whole of our sympathies lie with those nations that are giving their lifeblood in combat 
against those forces. The invisible presence of this supporter of ours dominated the convention. The banners, the cries, the cheers were all for him. And then finally, the old Democratic war horse nominated him. But to Hitler, the war was nearly over. And he began his triumphal return to Berlin by visiting Strasbourg, the city the French had left in no man's land. Now it was his. Cathedral and all. territory still, most of Eastern Europe, but he was never to be fated like this again. He was never to know a journey like this again. This was the very summit of his own personal triumph. He was now the master of Western Europe, even the signer of autographs. He was everything. The magician, the supreme warlord, the stern Führer, the smiling colleague, nice Uncle Adolf, so fond of the little one. In Berlin, blonde maidens were strewing rose petals for his Mercedes to crush. The city went out of its mind with hero worship. The crowd swarming to catch a sight of him, to wave and cheer until they were exhausted. And not all of them were enthusiastic Nazis. Not all of them were cheering his conquests. For many of them believed he was bringing them not only German triumph, but peace, and peace after so short a war.
General Vagon called the Battle of France in over. I expected the Battle of Britain is about to begin. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. Let us, therefore, brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. Not by fear, but by a certain exhilaration at finding themselves alone, and at last, by a sense of common national purpose, by a hardening of the will so lacking in France, we toiled and trained and looked to our defenses such as they were. If we couldn't sink the invader's ships, then we would set the very sea on fire. But the fact remained that the most powerful military force in the world was now only 21 miles away, almost within sight. Already, its guns were being aimed at our shores and firing at the ships that hugged our coast. At the moment, we can see two bright flashes, three flashes from the other side of the channel, and three great puffs of smoke, another fourth. And any moment now, the shells will be arriving over this side. Four columns of smoke going up on the far side as the convoy goes past us here. And there's the explosion. And the second. Just a very short front way in front of us to see here. Tremendous colorful water goes up. There's a third bomb just come down now. And there's one, uh, rather, one more to come, and there it is. All those four completely wide of the convoy, as they've all been so far, as the convoy seems past us slowly here. We waited for the invasion. Men and women at their posts, a nation alone, but high-spirited in its very alertness and defiance. Germans couldn't come yet by sea and land, they could reach us by air. Hello, what's this? No, old Jenkins cow again. Must be milking time. Here's something. This is more like it. Here they come. On sound, on sound. Hostile aircraft coming in northeast. And now we heard that throbbing sky, which was to haunt our ears for many, many months. The quintessential sound of 1940. Those famous white cliffs of Dover now shone in the face of the enemy. A challenge, a warning. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. <laughs> Goering's Luftwaffe was now the largest and most powerful air force in the world. It had already helped to defeat six nations. Britain was merely the next on the list. It will be all over in a few weeks. On July 10th, there began the Battle of the Air over Britain. But here for once, we were ahead in scientific aids and military organization. To begin with, our radar was much further advanced than theirs. 
when Goering and his air commanders made the mistake of seriously underrating our use of radar to feed information to our fighter command control rooms. Our elaborately organized control system was easily the best in the world. With the help of radar and our observer corps, we could send our fighters to the right place at the right time. Finally, as the spearhead of our defenses, we had a fighter plane that was the envy and the dread of all German pilots, the Spitfire. in Norway, Holland, Belgium, northern France, the Germans were already bombing convoys and seaports. And of course the nearest seaport of all, staring them in the face, was Dover. There's one going down on his target now. Here they come, they come in absolute steep dive, and you can see their bombs actually leave the machine. Then, but now the British fighters are coming up. You can hear our own guns going like anything now. I'm looking round now, I can hear machine gun fire, but I can't see our spit fires. There must be somewhere there. Oh, here's one coming down now. So somebody's hit a German and he's coming down with a long streak, coming down completely out of control, a long streak of smoke, and he's going flat into the sea and there he goes, smash! Hitler believed he could do a deal with Britain. So long as we acknowledged his mastery over Europe, we could keep our island and our empire. Outwardly, of course, he was the man who had won the great victory. But inwardly, he was pensive and he planned for the next stage. And the next stage at that time in his mind was the negotiated peace with Britain. That's to say, he wanted to do business with Britain. He said, and I translated that word for word, we mustn't touch the British Empire because it is one of the great elements of order in our modern world. The peace offer was made not only in a speech, but also on leaflets dropped on us in place of bombs. They found their way promptly into salvage wagons where they belonged. We would fight it out. We could now look forward to a besieged and heavily bombed Britain. Should our children go, or should they stay and take their chance? I was faced with this decision myself, and my family stayed. Many other parents felt they ought to send their children away. Everywhere, people had gathered at level crossings and on wayside platforms to wave back at the flutter of hands from our windows. We had minor excitements all the time, of course. Uh, we'd only left London half an hour when one of my party lost her hat. Shortly afterwards, I had to pull a tooth out.
long, grim ordeal began, escorted by fleets of fighter planes, the German bombers took off day after day. Day after day, the aerial invaders appeared as dots on our radar screens, were counted and plotted and reported to our wonderful fighter command control system. And day after day, our fighter pilots, those astonishing young men, ran to their machines to climb the sky again, to play hide and seek with the sun itself, to win a sudden glory, or to fall from the sky in flame and anguish. An air battle is really the most extraordinary thing because you close very, very quickly. Then you select an aircraft which you're going to try and shoot down. And that aircraft sees you and you see him and you start maneuvering to get at each other. And suddenly the air, in the most extraordinary way, is clear of all aircraft. You just don't see another one except this one that you're having a go at. It was a very lonely business, an air fight. You had to be tough in Dover and take everything as it came. Look, 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 look at those. Oh, yes, boy. Look, look, look. The, the pair of bombers. Oh, yes, well, that's another one. Uh, there's another oh, one. There's another one going down behind that cloud. Behind the cloud, look. There's no point over the cloud. The town soon became known as Hellfire Corner. The Luftwaffe pilots were fated as heroes after making exaggerated claims of British losses. On August the 11th, for instance, they claimed to have destroyed 93 British planes when the actual number was 38. They ended by claiming to have shot down more aircraft than we possessed. <laughs> Hitler visited an airfield to mark and honor the briefing for August the 13th, Eagle Day, the day of the kill when the Luftwaffe would make its maximum effort. Once again, the radar towers, which Goering ought to have destroyed before he did anything else, alerted all the defences. Scramble, we'd say. Victor 140, Angels 20. And Spitfires would tear into the sky and go off on their course over Maidstone, climbing to 20,000 feet to meet the oncoming enemy. As he came, We'd sit there on the ground and watch the plots and gather such information as we could from the Royal Observer Corps and from our Army Liaison Officers. And we'd pass information to the pilots, telling them all changes in the enemy's direction, how he was splitting up into different formations, what height he was flying at, and guiding our fighters to the most advantageous position, ready to attack. The great air battle, which has been in progress over this island for the last few weeks, has recently attained a high intensity. The conditions and course of the fighting have so far been favorable to us. The gratitude of every home in our island, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen who, undaunted by odds and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few.
German objective now was the destruction of fighter command itself. The precious airfields were being bombed every day, together with control centers and some aircraft factories. Here, we were most vulnerable. By the end of August, after six weeks of battle, fighter command was desperately strained. It was beginning to look like touch and go. Defeat in the air might mean invasion, and the army was still hopelessly ill-equipped. Out of sight, hidden from the limelight, the workers were fighting a desperate battle of their own, simply to maintain output at all costs. It was a desperate time, but sooner or later, the all clear would sound, the day's menace would come to an end, there would be time to breathe again, to tidy up and then take it easy for a spell before the bombers returned again. Any claims, Johnny? Uh, a 109 destroyed, buddy, yes. Oh, good show. How'd you get on, sir? I had a wonderful party, thanks. Are you all right? Did you get any of the bladders? Yes, I got a medicine at 109 in Adonia. The ground crews themselves work day and night rearming and refueling and repairing because the stock of replacements kept going down and the margin was getting narrower and narrower as the days went by. In those days, although I didn't know it at the time, we were actually down to a few days replacements. And that was all that stood between us and many grim possibilities. Hitler's empire now stretched from the North Cape to the Bay of Biscay and included most of Central Europe. During the summer of 1940, it wasn't too unpleasant living in this new Europe of his. The Channel Islands, for example, were occupied in what was apparently an easy, friendly fashion, almost in a holiday spirit. The German armies of occupation took care to behave correctly. The SS Tufts and the Gestapo torturers had not yet taken over. Germany was offering the conquered peoples a smiling image, and especially in its greatest conquest, Paris where the young German soldiers enjoyed themselves, but took care to be respectful. So many innocent and compassionate Teutons, no harm in them at all. But behind this smiling image, biding its time, was the hard core of Hitler Youth, trained and conditioned to fanaticism, hatred, callousness, brutality to create an iron empire that would last a thousand years, trained to despise Europe's age-old culture, fed on nonsensical notions, barbaric burners of books, conditioned to hate with ferocity the Jews and everything Jewish, just because Hitler had needed a convenient scapegoat. What Nazism really meant could already be seen in Warsaw, where in the ghetto, the SS and Gestapo brutes were doing what they liked. Fighting for freedom was not an empty phrase in 1940. What do we mean when we say that we are fighting for freedom? We want to be able to live our own lives as we like and not have to look over our shoulders all the time to see if the Gestapo is listening. We want to worship God as we like. And this religious freedom, based on conscience, we will not let go. Uh, but in Germany, they have given their consciences to Hitler so that people have become machines, merely fulfilling orders without considering whether they're right or wrong. Bad faith, cruelty, crime, they become right by the fact that it is he, Hitler, who ordains them. That is a fundamental challenge of Antichrist, which it is our duty as Christians to fight with all our power. 
September came and the Battle of Britain didn't slacken. And flyers, crews, ground staff were feeling the strain. The boys' abounding high spirits were rather stilled by September. They were strained and silent. Solidly and speedily, the enemy poured across the Straits of Dover. And still that magic eye of the radar spotted him. And still the tired pilots went up to shoot him down while he bombed their landing grounds beneath them. This effort of the Germans to secure daylight mastery of the air over England is, of course, the crux of the whole war. So far, it had failed conspicuously. For him to try to invade this country without having secured mastery in the air would be a very hazardous undertaking. Uh, if this invasion is going to be tried at all, it does not seem that it can be long delayed. Every man and woman will therefore prepare himself to do his duty, whatever it may be, with special pride and care. There were all manners of duties to be done. It might be giving up aluminium saucepans to provide more metal for aircraft production. We sacrificed our railings, though it never seemed a sacrifice to me. We were better without railings, either physical and actual, or mental and social. And the people without railings toiled to pour weapons out of their factories. And they too, like the airmen, were feeling the strain. The attacks from the air went on and on. Up went the fighter pilots yet again into their battlefield of air and cloud.
On September the 4th, addressing a huge and frenzied audience in Berlin, Hitler said, in England they are filled with curiosity and keep asking, why doesn't he come? Be calm, be calm, he's coming, he's coming. By this time, some of the children who'd been evacuated to America were talking on the air to their parents. Hey, can you hear me, dear? Yes, thank you. Now, you talk quickly, won't you? Yes. Have you heard Mr. from Mr. and Mrs. Miller yet? No, we aren't at that, our proper homes. We're staying at the Seamers Institute. Oh, that's not my daughter. That's not Elaine. Yes, it is, isn't it, Elaine? You're Elaine, aren't you? Yes. Uh, I, think, uh, I think, Mrs. Hill, that she's a little shy because our yes. studio is full yes. of people. All right, darling, you talk to Mummy. And uh, have you written to us yet? Yes, uh, we sent a letter and so did Pam. Has it reached you yet? No, it hasn't, dear. Not like Elaine. I expect it'll soon come, though. Yes, I hope so. Did you have a good voyage? Yes, thank you. I was only sick once. <laughs> Go, Jimmy. Now, how are you all feeling? Oh, OK. Well, OK, that sounds a bit American to me. <laughs> I say, you've been over there two, two months now, haven't you? Sure. And, and uh, well, what do you think about it? Jolly nice. It's jolly nice, is it? Hello, Alice. Hello. Talk loud, Alice. How are you? You just snort like a pig. <laughs> do you? Did this make the separation easier? Or harder, I don't know. But probably many of these goodbyes were felt to be final. Goodbye forever. Goodbye, Alan. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, Mommy. Goodbye, Daddy. Goodbye. 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 By now, September the 6th, Fighter Command was almost at its last gasp. How much longer could it hold the dangerous sky? But we kept steady, we drew close, and the days were good days because we were doing something that had to be done and doing it well. Goebbels' propaganda was telling the world we were now in a state of panic, like hell we were. But we were still waiting for invasion. Bombed by day, we waited for what any night could bring. On September the 7th, a fleet of German bombers, heavily escorted by fighters, took off for England. Radar had spotted them as usual, but their odd behavior left fighter command bewildered. For once, the German planes didn't disperse to bomb the airfields. Was this the invasion? these bombers had one target, London. Hitler's fury was now directed against the whole population of London. Berlin had just been bombed, but Goering, in his vainglorious way, had sworn that not a single enemy bomber would ever get through to Berlin, and he'd been proved wrong. Angry men, he and Hitler made a fatally wrong move, changing the whole course of the war. They switched from attacking fighter command, which was in serious danger of being knocked out, to a wholesale terror bombing of London itself.
losses Germany had suffered since Eagle Day, a month before, continued to mount. And for the first time, Hitler and Goering tasted the bitterness of defeat. On the day the invasion should have begun, September the 15th, there occurred the very last great daylight battle for the command of the air, and Hitler lost it, his first defeat. Air Ministry communicate. The biggest bag yet. 185 enemy aircraft shot down. Seven of them by anti-aircraft guns. And the remainder by our fighters. Our claims of aircraft destroyed that day may have been absurdly high, as indeed they were. But the actual number, 56, was quite enough. Goering's Luftwaffe was beat. So the harvest home of 1940 was a true and deeply felt thanksgiving service. The worst danger was over. daylight raids were abandoned in favor of continuous night bombing, which our fighters couldn't challenge. If our air force couldn't be destroyed, if our seas couldn't be crossed by invasion forces, then our people, bombed night after night, should be battered into begging for peace. The whole weight of the war should fall on them. It was about seven o'clock when the red came through and the bells went down. We all had a touch of butterflies in the stomach. We knew this was the business, see? Now the shout comes. Number one trailer pump to Dockhead Station. Well, we dashed across the road, and off we go in the old bus. I can remember us standing there with the sweat pouring off us and mucking our faces and eyes and the heat was terrific. As soon as you got any water on you, it dried. Plenty of bombs were coming down all the time. About one a minute, near enough to be uncomfortable. And you couldn't throw yourself down. You had to stay up with the bombs. You got hold of the hose about 50 times tighter when the bombs came down and ducked your head and feared the worst. But you stood up. London took most of the bombing, but fire and fury, destruction and death spread to provincial cities. And these sudden concentrated raids were harder to take than London's continuous bombing. London was so vast that you felt you could hide in it from the bombs. Whereas in smaller cities and towns, you felt that the bombs must inevitably find you. As night fell, many people in London now began a whole new way of living in their air raid shelters. When the bombing first started, uh, people were rather nervous, didn't know what to do. But after a few days, they soon got accustomed to this. People seemed to be um, frightened, but all quite steady, trying to comfort one another, even although they, they'd lost their parents or, or lost their homes. They were all um, trying to assist one another in any shape or form that they could. And a uh, few comedians sung a few songs, and everybody was more or less pretty happy.
sound happy enough down there tonight, don't they? Yeah, it's dead, all right. How many people must still remember that clean, fresh smell of the morning? It was as if mornings had just been invented. To my mind, even more wonderful than the cheerful fortitude of the mass of people was the elaborate network of services, many of them voluntary, organized to cope with every phase of the blitz. The air raid wardens, the fire and rescue services, the auxiliary police, the WVS and other women's organizations that brought help and sympathy to so many victims. Last night, lady, my house was gone. Yes. And all the things were gone. And I didn't know what to do. And I thought I'd come this morning to you to help me, if you could. Yes. Well, the best thing for you to do is to go round to the town hall and ask the town clerk for a form. But the major problem was to keep the vast city operating as a metropolis. The greatest danger of all was the threat to public health. Broken sewers and contaminated water could have meant an outbreak of typhoon. bombs that didn't explode were a bigger nuisance than those that did. They had to be cleared away by bomb disposal squads while traffic was diverted. I can remember when only one approach to Broadcasting House was open. But somehow we got there and carried on. While endurance might stave off defeat, it couldn't bring victory. We might hold out for years, but alone, how could we hope to win? We thought that by our own action, that that was the best way to convince others that we were worth helping. That, for instance, applied to the United States. We felt, as we showed ourselves able to defend our island and able to resist and repel the enemy, we should be proving that we were a friend whom it was not only out of kindness good to help, but out of policy wise to help. This wasn't lost upon some neutrals. I'm speaking from London. It is late afternoon and the people of London are preparing for the night. Everyone is anxious to get home before darkness falls, before our nightly visitors arrive. This is the London rush hour. Many of the people at whom you are looking now are members of the greatest civilian army ever to be assembled. These men and women who have worked all day in offices or in markets are now hurrying home to change into the uniform of their particular service. Soon the nightly battle of London will be on. This has been a quiet day for us, but it won't be a quiet night. We haven't had a quiet night now for more than five weeks. Now it's eight o'clock. Jerry is a little bit late tonight. The searchlights are in position. The guns are ready. The People's Army of Volunteers is ready. They are the ones who are really fighting this war. The firemen, the air raid wardens, the ambulance drivers. And there's the wail of the Banshee. The nightly siege of London has begun. The city is dressed for battle. O oh God, we commit ourselves into thy keeping this night. 
We pray thee to bless all those who are keeping us safe. For Christ's sake. London raises her head, shakes the debris of the night from her hair, and takes stock of the damage done. The sign of a great fighter in the ring is, can he get up from the floor after being knocked down? London does this every morning. Not all the services run as they did yesterday, but London manages to get to work on time, one way or another. In the center of the city, the shops are open as usual. In fact, many of them are more open than usual. I am a neutral reporter. I have watched the people of London live and die ever since death in its most ghastly garb began to come here as a nightly visitor five weeks ago. I have watched them stand by their homes. I have seen them made homeless. I have seen them move to new homes. And I can assure you, there is no panic, no fear, no despair in London town. There is nothing but determination, confidence, and high courage among the people of Churchill's Island. The presidential election in America was in full swing. Both candidates, Wilkie for the Republicans and Roosevelt again for the Democrats, were in favor of aid to Britain and of rapidly building up their home defenses. But because of this policy, Roosevelt was already being called a warmonger by the isolationists. And although he was returned again to the White House, it was by a much reduced majority. Nevertheless, Britain's stand, her victory in the Battle of Britain, and her resistance to the bombing were winning admiration, and Roosevelt could announce his policy quite firmly. No combination of dictator countries of Europe and Asia will stop the help that we are giving to almost the last free people fighting to hold them at bay. In the middle of November, chiefly for propaganda purposes, the full fury of the Luftwaffe, making its most violent attack yet, was unleashed against a single provincial city, Coventry. The raid began at half past seven and lasted till six o'clock the following morning. The noise of bombs and guns was incessant. The raiders dive-bombed and dived again. They dropped high explosives, incendiaries and explosive incendiaries. At least 20 big fires were raging at once and hundreds of smaller ones. the following morning it was drizzling and there was a mist over the town as men and women began to crawl out of their shelters to look for their friends and survey the ruins of their city. They could hardly recognize it. Remnants of walls with their ragged brickwork stood up like drunken sentinels helplessly guarding a scene of chaos. Hardly a building remained intact. It was impossible to see where the central streets we knew so well had been. Fires were still raging in every direction, and from time to time we heard the crash of a falling roof or wall. And as we walked round the ruined streets, we hardly knew what to do. It seemed so hopeless with our homes and shops and places of work and so much of our lovely old city in ruins.
with you about how very important it is that all water should be boiled before being used in commentary. No matter where you get that water from, whether it's out of a tap or anywhere else, will you please see that it is boiled before it is used? Now, secondly, the, another announcement from the Ministry of Health. Will you please make quite certain that you don't use any WCs or drains that are not working? Please dig a hole in your garden and get rid of the refuse there. The very center of the target was Coventry's famous old cathedral. Try to describe what Coventry Cathedral has meant to the citizens of Coventry. Uh, that grand old parish church with its tower and spire soaring to the sky and its huge, immense, majestic building. We all seem to love it. Everybody's loved it. But there, there it is. That night, the city burnt. And the mother church of the city burnt with her. Can't you have feeling that's a sort of emblem of the eternal truth that when men suffer, God suffers with them? It was not part of their blood. It came to them very late, with long arrears to make good, when the English began to hate. It was not suddenly bred. It will not swiftly abate through the chill years ahead, when time shall count from the date when the English began to hate. violence and effect of our indiscriminate bombing of Germany later has since been questioned, as well it might. But in that dark winter of 1940, we liked to feel we were hitting back and giving the Germans an increasingly bitter taste of their own medicine. I got a bullseye with the last one. not only hitting back in the air. Precious tanks were already on their way to the Middle East, where Wavell and his small army were shortly to take Mussolini's African empire to pieces. It was a measure of the confidence our leaders had in us that we would go on fighting, that sooner or later, somehow or other, we could win. This confidence was shared by Roosevelt, who announced in November his friendly device of lease lend which meant we no longer had to pay for American war supplies out of our dwindling dollar reserves. But had we known it, time was at last on our side. For in December, Hitler decided to invade the Soviet Union. It was a fatal decision. What a strange long year it had been. The dark confusion of the phony war and the fiasco in Norway seemed an age ago. What we'd achieved since then could never be clearly known because the victories were personal and private victories. Not so much perhaps over fear, but over self-deception, complacency, a traditional dislike of any new pattern of living. And our common defiance had begun to give the conquered peoples of Europe hope again. But then 1940 suddenly, and most perversely, struck back at us, a final curtain bringing down the last shreds of our complacency. Two nights after Christmas, incendiary bombs rained down on the city of London, an area supremely important but not properly covered by fire watches. 
By the third night, that of the 29th and 30th, six great conflagrations had been started, and more of London city was burning than at the time of the great fire. My particular corner of the fire was at a narrow crossroads near Fleet Street. One of the corner blocks on the far side from me was well alight, walls fallen away, doors and windows and floors inside shriveling and dropping. There was a boom and a roar as the gas main went. The girder became red hot and sagged. A piece of crumpled metal, a foot square, fell on the pavement and slowly uncurled. As the evening wore on, the buildings in the foregrounds collapsed. Luggage Hill was carpeted in hose pipes. A scampering rat here and there, a wheeling bird in the flames. The heat was so intense that embers were falling like rain and tattooing on your helmet. miles around, the sky was a bright orange red. The balloons of the barrage stood out as clearly as on a sunny day. The St. Paul's Cathedral was the pivot of the main part. All around it, the flames were leaping up into the sky. There the cathedral stood, magnificently firm, untouched in the very center of all this destruction. <laughs> Just before midnight, fire broke out in a nearby building. For a few moments, it deepened the glow in the sky, and then went out. And once again, the bulk of the cathedral stood out vaguely against the night. Somebody started the Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond. But before it ended, the strokes of midnight rang. It was 1941. Nineteen forty was made for BBC television and first shown on the twenty fifth anniversary of the Battle of Britain in nineteen sixty five.